When we say we have the evidence needed to investigate who Jesus is, what does that mean and how trustworthy is that evidence? My name is Chad Moore. I'm the Minister of Students and Families here at McGregor, and this is Beyond the Notes. So as we are walking through Act 2 of John chapter 9, the investigation that the Pharisees did into the uh, miracle of healing the man born blind by Jesus, um, you know, we talked about their investigation. We, we mentioned the fact that we also um, embark on an investigation our own in, in terms of trying to figure out who Jesus is, um, what he said, and what that means for us, and essentially answer that that big, lasting question of who do you say that I am that he asked his disciples. And while we do have some evidence outside of Scripture, much of the time we're referring to the things that we do have written in Scripture. And so um, what is that evidence and, and how trustworthy is it is a, um, a significant question to ask. And, you know, some people try to to claim that there isn't enough evidence to believe that there is a God or that Jesus is God or or that any of this around us is really real. And so some of that stuff you have to toss out as just being absurd. Um, but, you know, the Bible does speak in Romans chapter 9 to um, some of that evidence that is available just in nature. And it says this in verses 19 through 22. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their hearts, their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools." And so we see here in Romans in Romans 1 that everyone has already has access to all the information they need to know that there is a God and know certain things about God his, and his invisible attributes and his power and his creativity and, uh, and, and who he is. And then beyond that, we ask the question is, has this God communicated with us? Has he actually handed down any kind of message to his creation? And that's what we have in Scripture. And that message that He has sent to us through people speaking through them and speaking to them and through them, He then confirms with the miraculous. And He confirms that this is Him speaking, and this is His message about Himself and about what He says about us. And so we have access to this confirmed message within what we call Scripture, the, uh, the Holy Bible, the different words we use to refer to it. And now that that evidence does come under attack from many different people and trying to um, with trying with different accusations and criticisms about it. You know, some people just say, well, you know, it's really old and it's changed over time, right? We can't trust it because it's just been around so long. But we don't really say that about other things. You know, just because something's old doesn't mean it's automatically unreliable. You know, a lot of things that are, are made today are made in ways that you're, they're hoping you're going to replace parts in it or something, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a story. We're talking about um, the evidence and facts laid out about an event or a series of events that have happened. And so just because it's happened a long time ago doesn't mean that it's inherently unreliable. And so what would you want to to see, to trust in that that message or that grouping of writings. You would want a lot of copies, maybe. You'd want a lot of different people to be attesting to seeing this thing and not just be from one person or from one source. And we actually have access to that. You can you can study online. You can study about all the Greek manuscripts that we have, we have access to, about the Dead Sea Scrolls and about how their finding in the cave at Qumran helped back up the reliability of the Old Testament in a tremendous way that we did not have access to before that. And so this this outdated, even in itself, criticism that the Bible has been corrupted just must have been corrupted because it's old and changed over time. It just doesn't it doesn't hold a lot of validity. Another thing that gets said over time is that the Bible has contradictions. People try to point at one passage versus another passage and say, well, look, they, they are contradictory to one another. They are contradicting the message of the Bible. But I would argue that the Bible is internally consistent, that if you 
take a proper and lengthy study and figure out what's being said in each of the instances and in these passages that may appear to be contradicting at different times, that you actually realize that, for one, they are separate letters written to different groups of people and there's a different context to them, and that might be part of why you don't understand it. Or it could simply be different um, versions of the same truth. You know, if you were to take a group of people to a movie and, uh, and ask them individually afterwards, hey, tell me about that movie, what happened? You would get different versions of that story. They could all be equally true, and yet they would highlight different aspects of the story, the things that stood out to them. And uh, in fact, if you were to ask a police officer when they are on a, a crime scene, they're trying to investigate what happened, you know, when they hear the same exact story over and over and over again from different people, they start to assume that there might have been, um, that these people are actually lying because they've gotten their stories aligned with one another, that there should be some variation in what those people are saying, not true and false, but some variation because of their different perspective. And that's what we see with some of the supposed contradictions in Scripture is that they um, it, it, it's a matter of, of different perspectives on the same core truth. And when you study it, you can, um, you can decipher that and, and be able to follow along and realize that's not actually a contradiction. Um, and then, you know, Pastor Russell's even mentioned recently, I encourage you, if you're, if you're trying to figure out that um, parenthetic passage in, uh, in the Gospel of John that we've already covered, that trying to decipher whether or not it is an add-on to the original, because it's not found in the original manuscripts, and how do you actually respond to that? What should you do in, in a situation like that, where we have a portion of it that isn't in all the manuscripts, and how do we go about studying it? And the fact that being able to even know that it may have been added later actually adds to the validity of the breadth of Scripture, because we do have access to such an amount of manuscripts and copies and be able to actually track back and see where it may have been added. And so we actually have a more trustworthy set of documents in the Bible because we do have access and we're able to track things like that. And, and there, may, there are minor um, uh, differences between some of those, uh, some of those copies, but they're, none of them are corresponding to a core truth or a, a core um, theological point of Scripture. Much of it is just a, um, a, a different spelling or, um, or punctuation and, and those types of things that we find in terms of the differences between the, um, uh, the scrolls and, and copies themselves. And so, you know, and lastly, you know, some of it is just um, criticized. Well, the Bible just says some things that I simply can't believe. It involves some miraculous things that simply cannot have happened. The, um, the walking across uh, dry ground in the midst of a sea. You know, the resurrection itself. These miracles simply cannot happen. Science tells us that these miracles are impossible. Well, no. Actually, science cannot speak to miracles. It cannot speak to the supernatural or the miraculous because science is rooted in the natural. It's an observation of what's happening in nature. It's, an, it's, a, um, it's a prediction based on what you observe on a regular basis and tested based on the senses uh, that we have access to. And so the Bible is supernaturally confirmed, and those miracles are not are not even um, disproved by science. The, the, I think the best way to understand that and and see those kinds of criticisms of science and the miracles of Scripture is that science and our understanding of the natural provides the backdrop against which we actually notice miracles. If you were to go into a jewelry shop and they take a diamond out and, and, and show you it as an opportunity to, to purchase um, that jewel, they would often lay out some black felt and place that diamond on top of it so that you can see the contrast. You can see that diamond more clearly because of that black felt background behind it. And that's essentially the role that our scientific understanding plays, that we have this backdrop uh, where we know what is supposed to happen, what normally happens. And against that backdrop, we can notice the oddities, the supernatural occurrences that are not the natural things that we expect. 
And that's exactly what we see in the lives of the disciples and the people in Scripture. They were not just saying, oh, another dead person's come to life again today. Look at that. No, they were surprised. They were uh, they knew what was supposed to happen, and they were shocked when the miraculous happened. They weren't just naive to, um, to understanding the basics of nature. It was that they were noticing the supernatural and were responding as you would expect them to. And so we do have trustworthy evidence Hopefully, you are progressing in your faith and progressing in your understanding of of defending that faith and being able to answer criticisms and questions that people have when they try and poke holes in and attack the foundation of your faith and the um, the reliability of the evidence that that you are basing a, a, some of your decision making off of. And so, um, hopefully, this has been helpful. If it has, um, you can uh, subscribe to this podcast or share it with somebody else. You can uh, also look up and, and see the other podcasts that are available on our um, on, the, on the Burger podcasting um, platform. And, uh, you know, the final episode of Talk Truth for 2021 is going to be released this Thursday. You can join Chloe along with Pastor Russell and Pastor David as they discuss the topic of sanctification. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you again this coming Sunday as we complete our journey through John chapter nine.